In the past, I've definitely worked with a lot of um, pediatric brain tumors, a lot of machine learning, but today I'm sharing my mesothelioma, uh, radiotherapy, and immune response work. So we're based out of Perth in Western Australia, so it's not the coast that you usually see in the movies, or it's Sydney or Melbourne. But um, basing the National Center for Asbestos Related Diseases in Perth was not just an accident or choice. Uh, the Western Australia is the capital for mesothelioma incidents within Australia. This is due to the fact that a large manufacturing of asbestos related products was done right in Perth. And the Whitnew Mine, which was just a little bit north of us in Western Australia, uh, was the largest producer of blue asbestos for the Southern Hemisphere, which shipped a lot around the world as well. And so we see a large incidence showing up in our clinic in our hospital in Perth, the Charles Gardner Hospital. Um, we are based on uh, Charles Gardner campus at the Harry Perkins Institute for Medical Research. Um, some of you are probably familiar with uh, my boss, uh, Anna Nowak, uh, and her work. Um, she, we're been really proud of the DREAM trial, some of those data was presented this morning, um, combining um, chemotherapy at the same time as giving uh, checkpoint blockade. Um, this has been something Anna's been working on since the early 2000s, where she started her PhD. And kind of what my work is on now, the preclinical work I'm about to show you, is kind of setting up uh, hopefully for another trial where we're looking at looking at checkpoint, but this time giving at the exact same time as radiotherapy. Um, we do in Australia only do give uh, photon therapy. I, I bring that up just because of the last speaker. We are there's some really good rad onks in Sydney who are very much advocating for proton therapy, but we're about five years away from getting funding to even get the machine. And by the time we get it, it's only going to be in Sydney, which is going to be very far away from our particular patient group in Perth, um, but should help um, other types of cancer treatment, especially brain tumors in Sydney. Um, but anybody who gets mesothelioma in Western Australia in the next decade, protons are not going to be an option. It's only going to be photon therapy for them. Uh, I'm going to give a simplified overview of just how uh, radiotherapy kind of s um, activates the immune response system, um, just very so we're all on the same page. So as was already discussed, photons uh, can come in, damage the DNA, leading to cell death. It's the primary cause of action for tumor death with, from radiotherapy. But there are also bystander effects. One of those bystander effects is increased hypoxic environment that's caused by radiotherapy. This leads to more cell death. And another bystander effect is the immune response. So different cytokines are released. This can pull in um, dendritic cells into the microtumor environment. They can recognize new antigens that are there as a cleaning up the debris. They can then recruit in T cells. Um, previous research has already showed increased T cells to the tumor bed, um, increased amount of T um, cytotoxic CD8 cells, um, and most recently, this is only like last year or so, a decreased amount of T regs, which downregulate uh, cytotoxic T cells um, as well. And in very, very rare cases, um, these T cells they can expand, they can proliferate, uh, they can seek out and find other tumors at other locations and attack them as well. Recognize those same neoantigens, and this is an off-target effect of radiotherapy, sometimes called the abscopal effect. Um, it's rare, but it's seen in almost all solid tumor treatments, <coughs> in melanoma, you name it. Um, and I'm just going to go over a little bit of how checkpoint works. We, this was shown this morning, but I want to bring up a couple little minor things. Um, and so we it was talked about this morning that, you know, PD, PD-L1 and PD-1 um, ligand receptor specifically can downregulate the tumor response. You don't, you don't, the immune response, you don't want immunity going crazy. You, if you have a cut or a wound, you do want to regulate that and eventually have that come down, that immune, that regulatory pathway. And these receptors are not just tumor specific, right? They're on all your body. They're, they're part of the reasons. Anti-CTLA-4 on Tregs, um, you know, uh, OX40, TIM3, Tim these help stop things from everyone getting lupus from all kinds of autoimmunity. And this kind of brings up one of those questions from this morning is PDL1 negative mesothelioma and treating with anti pdl one And I'm, by the way, I'm going to use just the targets for the terms for today just because these drug names have different uh, names in different countries. And in Australia, our drug names may be different than American ones. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind is, is that for pdl one it's also on macrophages. And so while well, tumor heterogeneity is definitely involved, and you know, if you take a biopsy and it's pdl one negative, is all a cancer pdl one negative? No, that's true. Of course not. It, there could still be pd one positive other tumor sites, or just you got a wrong piece of it. 
But some of the effects on some of these treatments is that you're also hitting these macrophages. And these macrophages can downregulate the T cell response. And we know that almost all our modalities, whether it's surgery, we talked about this morning, chemotherapy, they are immune mediated. We didn't really understand that in the last 20 years. We've definitely understood it much better. And the success or failure of these treatments tend to have an immune component. And um, you see that in, um, in T cell deficient radiotherapy. Radiotherapy just doesn't work without the T cells. And so when we add in checkpoint in there, we're getting an increased tumor immunity, not just from decreasing the tumor's ability to deactivate the T cells, but also secondary immune uh, components have that same effect. So again, as we're kind of talking, the idea of my preclinical research is to facilitate that data to eventually launch a clinical trial. Um, we want to look at, can we make the targeted localized therapy more responsive to radiotherapy with checkpoint? We also want to look at, can we get systemic response, get other tumors, increase that obscopal effect to radiotherapy? And we're looking at understanding more the specific immune response to mesothelioma in these models. And so how we're doing that is we got, uh, we take these mice, these, all this work's done preclinically in mice. We're using uh, AB1 cell line, which is um, a cell line derived by our group many years ago before I joined by exposing mice to blue asbestos fibers uh, and then cultivating that up. Um, we've, there we go. Um, so the treatment protocols, basically, we give fractionation radiotherapy, similar to how you would in the clinic, and then we kind of just monitoring the effects. We treat one tumor in a dual tumor mouse, the other secondary tumor acts as the untreated metastases tumor response. And we repeat this in uh, black six mice with an AE17 uh, model, uh, as, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with. If you cure one model, you've just cured one patient, and so you have to test this in multiple models. Um, our patients at Charles Gardner are treated with the cyber knife, which most of you are familiar with. Again, we're limited to photon therapy. Um, in mice, we use an XRAD, which is a very similar unit. There's most groups around the U.S. have these kind of machines now, too. They allow us to take a CT image. Uh, the gantry arm floats around. We add a collimator, which then allows us to do 3D uh, image-guided radiotherapy to the mice uh, to target the tumor specifically, which allows us to, of course, um, spare um, critical structures such as left and right kidneys, which are quite radiosensitive, and make sure we're sparing the counter tumor. This is the treated tumor here. Because um, if you treat the untreated tumor, then it's not really a control. Um, it was kind of brought up um, just in the last talk, actually, um, that um, there isn't a lot of data on the understanding of how radiotherapy affects mesothelioma. And part of this is not, again, because radiotherapy doesn't respond to radiotherapy. It's because we just don't do it. It's, it's, it can be quite dangerous. The side effects are harsh. And therefore, there isn't a lot of literature on the best approaches for setting these things up. There's lots in osteosarcoma. There's lots in melanoma, but not really for meso. So we had to kind of develop which radiotherapy dose we were going to use. And we started with, based on literature and other diseases, uh, 9 gray, 18 gray, 27 gray, given three fractionation splits. And the one thing that came out of this quickly was that 9 gray had no effect at all, um, which is this uh, line here, compared to our controls. And 18 gray and 27 gray did see a response. We ended up going with 18 gray because we had less total cures, and we wanted to be able to then shift that and we get more cures, basically. And there was no statistical difference between 27 and 18 gray from a growth response, um, just overall survival. Um, if you look directly at uh, the data just from the 18 grays, if this works, there we go. Um, I'm just showing this graph quickly to show two kind of points. Uh, the first is that if you look at the untreated tumor um, in the treated mouse compared to the control, there's no difference at all. So that's basically showing that we have zero abscopal effect in our baseline model for these mice. The, other, the un, untreated tumor is having no change in growth. And the other thing um, that comes out from this is that um, while the originally we, we sectioned to keep our mice tumor sizes very uniformed, um, even that small range we had um, ended up having an effect. And this is something we weren't terribly surprised to see. We've seen this with chemotherapy. We've seen this with checkpoint therapy alone that there is a size uh, response uh, relationship. Um, so this was something we then controlled for in our later experiments and even narrowed that window down for treatment size even smaller. So the next step was to add in our checkpoint therapies. So we have anti-P1, anti-TIM3, anti-CTLA4, and anti-OX40. The first three um, are all inhibitory pathways. So they work like I previously described in the first slide and how people have described earlier this morning. 
Um, Antiox, uh, Antiox 40, however, is a stimulatory uh, marker, so it's the opposite. So if it, when activated, it turns on that immune response. Um, this is just a 3D reconstructed of my CT image of my mouse, just to show these tumors do grow symmetrically. Um, they are uh, a good model for this metastasis model. And previous work in our lab has shown with um, combination checkpoint that these tumors respond symmetrically as well. So it wasn't something I needed to double check. And it's, it's just kind of important to note that, like with humans, we do see responders and non-responders, even within the same genetically identical mice. Um, but again, what's important for my study is that they, if one side responds, these are color coded, that both sides respond. So it's not, I can, I can look at the abscopal effect and not worry about that one tumor is responding to checkpoint and the other one just isn't. Um, so I'm just going to go over this data quickly from anti PD1. Um, this is uh, our control mice again, a line you've seen already. They, uh, they die out quickly because these, these have two tumors on them. Uh, so it's a double tumor burden, so they don't live as long, unfortunately. Uh, um, when we add in radiotherapy again, this is just the controls. Uh, we see a response from radiotherapy, secondary tumor, nothing. Um, when we added in uh, PD-1 alone, this, a blue line was just drawn, it's hard to see right over top. There's literally no difference between PD-1 alone and untreated. It had no effect on our tumors as a single agent therapy. Um, and then combination, um, unfortunately, um, the secondary tumor, no no effect there, but we got more cures um, when we added it to the radiotherapy treated local site. Um, OX40 and TIM3, I'm just going to show these quickly because we didn't have any response. And these ones, um, that was significantly different. Um, but one of the things that we was interesting to note, we would love to watch is would this be, would these stay down longer? Would the combination checkpoint and radiotherapy at the local site continue uh, before growing back out again? as radiotherapy alone uh, mice do. Because the radiotherapy alone mice, those tumors do, they go down and they come back up. Um, which is something we wanted to explore in a single tumor model uh, afterwards, which I'll show in a sec. Um, and this is just for completeness to show you the survivals, but as you can imagine, you saw those growth curves. There's no surprise here that radiotherapy plus checkpoint is no different and that there was no response in checkpoint alone. CTLA-4 um, did have um, response, partial responders. We have some mice that were cured with CTLA-4 alone, alone, some mice that did not respond, and some that had um, disease control and then grew out. Um, when we could add this back into radiotherapy, um, we saw a really nice localized effect of these, these tumors were all cured. Um, again, we weren't able to maintain the kind of watch to see after day 60 would these come back better than our controls because the secondary tumors grow out and then cause the mice to die, which then allowed us to sort of say, okay, we really got to look at this localized response. This is where this is happening. Uh, we're not seeing this off-target effect. Um, and this is just survival, no difference. Um, so we looked at single tumors. These are single tumor mice now. Um, we give checkpoint before, three days before, and radiotherapy again um, after. And these are actually the wrong dates. This should be 12, 13, 14. Sorry about that. Um, and the two graphs at the top are no surprise because this is similar data from before, it's just different cohort. When we give, um, this is TIM3, OX40, and PD1 alone, and right below it is a corresponding one for each one with radiotherapy. Um, TIM3 uh, alone failed to have any result, um, but when we added in radiotherapy back in, we got all cures, which was um, better than radiotherapy alone. Um, OX40 didn't show any difference. Uh, PD-1 showed us some, it had some partial responders and uh, with PD-1 alone, but all cures with radiotherapy again, uh, better than radiotherapy alone. Um, and these mice stayed cured and the tumors did not grow back. So the next thing we wanted to look at was, was this cure, well, were these mice as tumors went away, was that something that had memory T cell effects? Was this going to be, are they now immune to their disease? So we set up a re-challenge experiment with these mice. Uh, inoculated some new control mice, 100% uh, of them grew their tumors out, which is what you would expect. Um, and um, I don't have the actual curves for this because they are kind of interesting for delayed growth. But the real, I think, take home from this particular slide and this experiment is radiotherapy alone's involvement. So the fact that we're talking about radiation as a treatment and its modality of being related to the immune response is definitely demonstrated by this fact that post-treatment these mice maintain their immunity to these cells. And now, keep in mind these um, tumor models 
and these mice are both ge all genetically identical. Uh, even though there is heterogeneity within the tumors, each one is considered to be heterogeneously similar. Um, so looking at the T cells within these tumors, within the microtumor environment, we took different time points. I'm just going to show you some, a couple snippets from a couple snapshots because to show it all would be far too long. Um, if we're looking at day five, uh, just as an example, one of the things you have, to under, you have to keep in mind with this kind of stuff is it takes time to, um, to have, to elicit an immune response to any kind of therapy. It's not uh, it's not an instant thing as, as radiotherapy's DNA damage response can be. You can measure that within six hours. You can look at cleave caspase, gamma H2X, uh, DNA damage markers, and you can see that right away. It takes longer to be able to measure an immune response. Uh, so we look at day five here. Um, these are CD4 helpers within the tumors, untreated, irradiated, and a non-irradiated tumor in a treated mouse. Uh, there's no dramatic shift at day five um, between these kind of groups. Um, but with inside the subpopulations, looking at the checkpoint markers, um, they're kind of staying fairly constant for radiotherapy alone at this time point. Um, if we look at later time point, further along, it's day, uh, about, uh, about day 20 of post-radiotherapy treatment. So this is a tumor that was 9 by 9 and then grew out uh, to be about 30 by, eventually did grow out, and then the bigger one came larger. If you look at the untreated tumor, uh, the vast majority of the T cells within the microtumor environment are CD4s. And when you look at the radiated tumor, we see the shift from C4 population to the CD8 population, cytotoxic T cells, um, increasing that amount. And when you look at within those subpopulations, and the colors stay the same for the rest of these slides, red's gonna be treated and um, blue will be untreated. Uh, we're seeing upregulation of all the checkpoint markers um, in the irradiated tumor in the CD4 helpers. And we see that also within the CD8s. Um, and the PD1 expression goes high up as well. And this is one of those things where this kind of relates back to what I said at the beginning, is we know these treatments, whether it's chemo, whether it's checkpoint alone, whether it's radiotherapy, we know they upregulate these markers. We know they upregulate um, various checkpoints. And so when you take a biopsy pre-treatment, that may not necessarily be what those markers will be present post-treatment, especially when you're looking at checkpoint where in a lot of the trials and doing meta-analysis checkpoints given as second-line therapy, they've already gone through something else already, and so it may not be the same kind of environment. Um, with checkpoint therapy alone, um, this is uh, three different groups because these are the mice that kind of came off around the same time. I don't have a CTLA-4 mouse because they do better, so there was no time point matching for this one. Um, we have a control mouse, anti-TIM3 and anti-PD-1. Um, some of the things take home from this is the set of T cells uh, kind of stay the same um, for the T helpers, but there is a shift within the CD4 positive cells. So a shift between the helper cells and the T regs, which downregulate um, the, the cytotoxic T cell response. And so while these percentages total are the same, we see from the control, um, which starts with a lot more T helper cells and fewer T regs, we're seeing more T regs when we treat. And again, this is sort of coming back to the idea that our treatment has an effect on either upregulating or downregulating those effects. And one of those things we think about when we're saying, why doesn't that abscopal effect happen? Why is the abscopal effect so rare? And part of this, um, the hypothesis is that because we're upregulating all these checkpoints, because we're increasing the anti sort of autoimmunity towards these diseases, um, it's suppressing that effect. And so tweaking that, attacking it from multiple angles, might hold the key to increasing the abscopal effect. Um, within those subpopulations of cells, again, I'm just going to look over these just quickly for funsies, for those of you who like data, like me. Um, OX40, uh, no change within the cytotoxic T cells. Increase amounts uh, in anti-PD-1 treatment, um, both in PD-1, which we see again and again, when we treat with, with PD-1, we see increased anti-PD-1, I mean PD-1 expression. Um, and CTLA-4. Um, within the CD4 positive cells, split between the helpers and the Tregs. Um, again, upregulation of all the markers uh, in the treatment groups compared to the controls. Um, in the Tregs, CTLA-4 is high in everything. This is to be expected. Tregs um, express CTLA-4 consistently. It's always on. Um, and so the, the big kind of divider here against PD-1 is up again in the anti-PD-1 TIM-3 groups. Again, 
Um, and the ongoing experiments uh, is kind of what I kind of hinted at is the experiments I'm running now are involved combining the checkpoints. OX40 plus CTLA4, PD1 plus TIM3. If we're, if we're only treating with one reagent and it's causing all the markers to be upregulated, then even though we're blocking one of those breaks, we're still seeing a suppressed response because everything else is turned up. But if we can take out all the breaks at the same time and really let the immune system take over, we hope to then be able to push that response and move that boundary from that 20 to 30 percent responders and push that boundary up. Can we get 70 percent responders? Can we get 75 percent responders? And so um, that's kind of the modality of the research going forward and hopefully that will give us which therapies and based on this expression data, which ones we should pursue moving forward with um, going to a trial. Um, I'd just like to thank um, my supervisors, Anna and Alistair, um, help that's been given to me by Yost and Richard Lake, who are part of the NCARD as well. Uh, Sarah, who is now Sarah Dart, actually, she just got married on Saturday. Um, and Amy, uh, who's been helping a lot of my flow stuff. Um, most of my work before this was like epigenetics and, and sequencing stuff. I hadn't done flow cytometry until I joined this group. And um, all our funding bodies, Cancer Council WA, um, UWA, and Australian government. Thank you.